yeah, so this I do is more forward outreach. So I train on Alexa. Um, like I'm doing all the pharmacy. Good evening. My name is Heather Colnan, and I'm the assistant principal here at Bethlehem High School. I would like to welcome everyone who has joined us for tonight's very important conversation, Opioids and Teens, The Deadly Truth. I will begin by thanking our Special Education and Student Services Department, especially our Director of CES, Kathy Johnston, who in her role as Administrator overseeing health and wellness at Bethlehem, is responsible for bringing this program to our school and community. I would also like to thank our Board of Education and Jody Monroe, our Superintendent of Schools, for their ongoing support and commitment to help raise awareness of what has become an epidemic nationwide. No community has been spared, including ours. Heroin, of course, has been the buzzword, and with good reason. According to the Centers of Disease Control, heroin use has more than doubled among young adults ages 18 to 25 in the past decade. Heroin is a highly addic addictive opioid drug with a high risk of overdose and death for users. But heroin use is part of a larger substance abuse problem. More than 9 in 10 people who used heroin also used at least one other drug, and 45% of people who used heroin were also addicted to prescription opioid painkillers. With our presentation this evening, and those our students experienced earlier today, our hope is to promote awareness and a better understanding of a problem that exists right outside our front door and provide tools to recognize at-risk behaviors and resources to deal with young people who may need support and intervention. Tonight you will hear from a panel of experts who include Dr. Michael Daly, Department of Emergency Medicine at Albany Medical Center, Heather King, New York State Board of Pharmacy member and Pharmacy Systems Coordinator and Pharmacy Compliance Officer, Detective Mike Whiteley, Bethlehem Police Department, Jack Daly, Hope House Additions Coordinator, Austin M. and Austin C., who are currently going through treatment at the Hope House. Some of our panelists will share with you powerful personal stories of addiction, recovery, strength, and healing in hopes that by working together, we can bring about positive change and make a difference in the lives of our youth. We thank all of our experts for their contributions to this effort, and I thank all of you for taking the time to join us this evening. At this time, I would like to welcome Jody Monroe. Thank you, Ms. Cullen. I just want to welcome you and really thank you for coming this evening. Uh, this is a really important conversation and awareness of parents, community, and the school district. So anything we can provide uh, in support of information that you would like, please let us know. I'd really like to thank our panelists. They've been here. They did a student presentation today, a faculty presentation, and they're here this evening to share uh, their experiences and their knowledge with you. So hopefully you'll get good information um, and any questions you may have, please. Any concerns you have, please feel free to reach out uh, to any of the administrators in the district for assistance. Um, so I'd really like to thank everyone for being here. Thank you, Ms. Cullen and Ms. Johnson for really putting this together. They've done all the legwork and um, enjoy the evening. I don't mean to run out, but I'm going to go find out what's going on at Eagle with the fire alarms and all the trucks that are going over there. So um, thank you again. Thank you all. I'm uh, just going to take a minute to make sure I don't get lost in the slides here for a second, which I may. So while we're waiting for that to kick off, just a little bit about my background. Um, I am an emergency physician at Albany Med. Um, I'm also the regional EMS medical director for the six counties around Albany and serve the state in both the state emergency medical and state trauma advisory committees. Um, along the way, my career took a little bit of a detour as the opioid epidemic hit, and I began doing more and more work in terms of bringing the ability to treat opioid overdose um, to the general population. Um, in 2006, the state of New York passed a law that allowed um, members of the community to carry the drug naloxone 
um, which Heather will tell you a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, and that took place for just the general public. From there, uh, we started expanding it as well, almost backwards, because paramedics were giving this, we were giving it in the emergency department, the public was giving it, but basic EMTs on rescue squads throughout New York weren't able to give it. Um, so we brought the program to these basic EMTs so they could use it in their communities, particularly affecting rural communities and some areas of suburbia. Um, we also then brought it to police officers, even more impacting the rural communities where the police officers were getting to scenes 15 or 20 minutes before an ambulance could get there. It seems to make a little bit of a difference. But around the whole thing, we just have to focus on the fact that where did these drugs come from and why are they affecting us now? And why are they affecting us so disproportionately from where they've been in the past? So with that said, maybe, yes. Um, I have no disclosures, it's a place to start. Um, I certainly have no financial disclosures uh, because really at the end of the day, emergency physicians, if you get hurt, we want to see you, but the reality is we don't want your business. We know everybody's going to need an emergency department at some point. Um, but really, at the end of the day, we hope nobody ever does. So why do we have an overdose, an, ep an opioid overdose epidemic? Well, part of it does fall right back on the physicians. And as a physician, I'm here to tell you that we're part of the blame. Now, not every time a physician makes a decision is it a good one. And I love this. I tried actually to take this slide out, and Detective Whiteley wouldn't let me because he get, enjoys it too much. The reality is physicians have made bad decisions over the years. This was one of them. We should not have supported the tobacco industry, and we should not have said, hey, smoke camels, right? Bad idea. Well, if you, trans if you transpose that same wrong thinking to the 90s, we took pain and we made it the fifth vital sign. And we said everybody needs to be asked whether or not they have pain. Is that a bad idea? No, that's a good idea. It's the next step we took. And everybody's pain needs to be made to completely go away. If you have a broken bone, there's only one way the pain's going to go away. You're going to heal. Until then, there's going to be some discomfort. We changed the expectations of the patients that we served from there will be some discomfort to we want your pain to go to zero. We went from here are a few pain pills to cover you for a couple of days to here are 75 pain pills to last you until I see you again in a couple of weeks. And as a result, we ended up with huge amounts of excess opioids throughout the community. We also, in many cases, didn't police our own. And pill mills began to, shop, to pop up, where people would go and fill prescriptions that had absolutely no medical validity, and doctors would be writing these to make a buck. Now, a lot of those physicians are now in federal penitentiary, exactly where they belong. And the rest of the physicians are slowly learning how to prescribe for optimal pain management for our patients, while at the same time not damaging society. What are these drugs we're talking about anyway? What are opioids? Opioids themselves are drugs that are either derived from or similar to opium. The drug I think of that's the key to all of this is really morphine. And morphine is named after the Greek god of sleep, Morpheus. If you think about sleep and that peaceful slumber that you fall into, that's exactly what opioids do. They slow everything down. They make you peaceful. They make you tired. And in some cases, if you take too much of them, they make you so tired, so sleepy, that you forget to breathe. That's the problem of the opioid overdose. Then there are other drugs that are similar to, op to opium, to morphine, that are also drugs that we use in common practice. And that would be things like oxycontin, oxycodone, hydrocodone, any one of which you may have been on at some point because of an acute injury that you suffered and pain management that was prescribed by a physician. Fentanyl, that's an incredibly strong drug that we hear about being mixed with illicit drugs that actually now we also use medically and it works wonderfully. But the key to all of these are the right drug at the right time for the right indications as prescribed by a physician. 
That's the key to all of this. The other drug that we talk about in this mix is heroin. Heroin is a perfect example of medical care and pharmace pharmaceutical research gone wrong. It was developed actually as a less addictive form of morphine or opium. We really screwed that up. It's not less addictive. It's more addictive, if anything. It is also a really good cough medicine. If anybody tells you they're taking it for cough, they're lying. That's not the reason anybody takes it now. And there's no legitimate reason for heroin to be out there right now. Right? There are also other drugs like methadone. I'm not going to spend any time on that. We can talk about that afterwards if anybody wants to. Drugs that aren't opioids, things like cocaine, amphetamines, right? Xanax and Valium, not opioids. Now, why are they so much trouble? These drugs are trouble because inside our body are naturally occurring receptors for them. And because those naturally occurring receptors are there, these drugs fit really well into our bodies and they work very, very effectively. If you take these drugs for extended periods of time, your body actually makes more of these receptors. And we have no idea who is going to make more of these receptors after just a couple of doses and who's going to make more of these receptors after a long period of time. There's no way to know who's actually going to become physically dependent on these drugs when we start giving them. That's why they have to be given carefully under the guidance of a physician. The other thing that's important is addiction, which in many cases people will need to take escalating doses of these drugs and continue to do what's called chase the dragon to try to develop the same high that they had once before. The first thing they reach for is a sense of normalcy when those receptors are filled. The thing that happens after that is then trying to get high, and that gets harder and harder and harder over time. But this is a problem that primarily affects us here in the first world. If you look across the globe, and this is something absolutely dramatic that just came out a couple of days ago, 75% of the world, 5.5 billion people, have no access to opioid pain relief. That's legitimate pain medicine when they legitimately have pain. Doctors don't have that tool at their disposal. And if you look across the world again at morphine use, 92% of the morphine is consumed by 17% of the world's population. That's incredible. And again, it points to the problem being the way we're practicing medicine here and then the way that's been changed. If you look at the impact of prescriptions across the country right now, this chart always amazes me as you look at that purple belt right down the middle of the country, right, the purple belt across the middle of the country, 96 to 143 prescriptions per 100 people per year for opioid medications. That is an incredible number. This is one of those times it's great to be in New York because actually we're doing things well. Doesn't mean that we're doing it great. We're doing it better than we are in the purple stripe, right? But that's getting better as well. Over time, we've developed strategies in specifically to address overdose. Among those, something that actually a lot of physicians hated when it came out, and frankly, I see as something that's been a boon, the iStop program. The iStop program is a prescription monitoring program. Quite frankly, it's a pain. Anytime I want to prescribe a medication that's a control, I have to go online, I have to look up the individual, and I have to see what they've gotten, all of their other previous pain medicine prescriptions. But as a physician, that gives me an incredible tool in the emergency department to be able to take that list into a patient and say, hey, listen, you've been treated by these, these physicians, and you filled these prescriptions at all of these different pharmacies, you're not getting anything from me today. Or I can look and see that this is somebody legitimately with a painful condition, and they're taking their medicines exactly the way they're supposed to. So this tool is working exactly the way it should. And what it's doing ultimately is specifically decreasing and significantly decreasing the amount of doctor shopping there is for opioid medications in New York State. Something else that's really important that Heather's going to touch on, I think, a little bit more, which is drug take-backs. Um, and I'm not going to get into that anymore right now. We can talk about some of these other things later. New York, 75% reduction 
in multiple prescriber um, prescriptions to individuals. That's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. That means we're heading in the right direction. And as we look at these pill mills getting shut down and we look at the multiple prescriber situations decreasing, that's great. We're getting legitimate medicines off the street. We're getting them away from our children. We're getting them out of the communities. Fantastic. But there's a downside. And it's an ugly downside. And that's actually the upsurge in heroin. So we have a resurgence in heroin. Now there are a lot of different reasons. Socioeconomic reasons, the prescribing I described, geopolitical reasons, a lot of different reasons that heroin has taken this sudden, this sudden rise. And as we look, it actually has a significant racial disparity. Right? The upsurge in use of, use of heroin is specifically affecting the white community. It's relatively steady in the black and Latino communities. Right? But this huge spike affecting a population where it's never been before is very troubling. And the nice thing is the interventions that we put in place to take care of this spike will work right the way across all of society, which is important. Now these drugs, when you take too much of them, kill. And when they kill, what they do is they slow the breathing, as I said before, and when the breathing stops, then at some level you start getting some brain damage. And after that, the heart stops, and then people die. Our goal at any point in any of the programs we have to treat opioid overdose is to stop things right there. When people start becoming hypoventilatory or breathing very shallowly, not breathing enough, turning blue, that's when we want to reverse that overdose. We want to reverse that overdose in time to be able to get them back. What's important and we teach the community is that you've got to call 911. Detective Whiteley will talk a little bit about a program that we have in New York that allows people to call 911 without any potential hazard. They won't get arrested. They won't get charged in some cases. It's called the Good Samaritan Law. They actually make a difference. Does it give you a complete pass on any past crimes? No, but it gives a pretty good place for our, for our police officers to start to be able to arrive take care of somebody and not to have to worry about the enforcement end right away and to keep our youth safe from the feeling that they can't call because they're going to get somebody in trouble. We need to make sure that people feel safe enough to call. Very few people overdose alone. And the goal actually is that people should use together because if they do use together, they're using more safely. And the safer we keep this behavior, the less likely, we are, less likely we are to have deaths. Every time we prevent a death, we give people the opportunity to make better choices and give them a second chance. Philip Seymour Hoffman was quoted as saying that if one of us, meaning famous people, dies of an overdose, probably 10 who are about to won't. I think he was wrong. And he was wrong by a factor of 10 or wrong by a factor of 100. I don't know what that number really was. But Philip Seymour Hoffman's death, more than any other death that we've seen, really prompted a change in our approach to opioid overdose and the problem of opioid addiction in the United States. We're at a point now where we can make a big difference for our communities, and I think we're on the way there. So, nothing further. Don't come see me at work. Thank you all for being here. There we go. 
So I'm going to give a little bit of background on myself also. Um, is that showing up? There we go. I've been a pharmacist for about 18 years um, and have been in the field for quite a while. And then recently I started to get more involved with outreach programs through the New York State Board of Pharmacy. And I was also on the governor's iStop committee that kind of created all this, these problems for the prescribers. Um, and I've really gotten involved with a lot of um, overdose, a lot of outreach, and now I do a lot of training for naloxone. And we'll get a little into that a little bit as we progress in this uh, discussion. So what is considered prescription drug abuse? Um, I'm going to kind of piggyback a lot on what Dr. Daly said, but drug abuse is pretty much taking a drug, a prescription drug, um, that wasn't prescribed for you in a way that it wasn't prescribed for you and for a purpose that it wasn't prescribed for you. I think we might have all done this a little bit in our past, but this is what's becoming the, the big epidemic, is people are sharing drugs. So why prescription drugs? Why do we think that people are turning to prescription drugs as opposed to marijuana, alcohol? Back when I was in high school, we never heard about taking prescription drugs. It was always the marijuana, the alcohol, maybe a little bit of cocaine back then. So the reason is people think prescription drugs are safe. Since we've been children, our parents have given us medicine whenever we've, we haven't felt good, felt good. Our grandparents take medicine, everyone takes medicine. Therefore, we feel like they are relatively safe. Um, but every medicine has some risk of harmful side effects. Um, prescri prescribers always weigh the benefits against the risk before prescribing, and they do know you. Um, they always have to take into effect factors like weight, medical conditions, genetics, medical history, um, the other medicines that you're on, and of course, all the side effects. So another reason is the ease of access. So when you think about prescription drugs, you say it's not easy to access prescription drugs. I have to get a prescription for it. And that is the way it's supposed to be, but that's not the way that it has been lately. So where do the abusers, people that take prescriptions that aren't for them, or not for their, the purpose that they're taking them, where are they getting them from? And this is what gets kind of scary. 70% of the people that abuse prescription drugs are not getting them from actual prescriptions written for them. They're getting them from their friends and from their families. Some are buying them from friends and family members. Um, and some of them are stealing them. So we're gonna get into that quite a bit because that's where as parents, as friends, and neighbors, and relatives, you really come into play here. So. So let's think about this a little bit. How many of you actually have controlled substances still in your house from maybe, I don't know, a dental procedure that you had or a cold that you had? Okay. What are you doing with them? And why do you still have them? Probably, you never know when you might need them again, right? Or you just don't really know what to do with them? Well, here's a story for you. We had, um, and I'm sure you guys have some other stories too. We had a, a drug raid that we heard about, and it happened to be that the drugs that were found were stolen from an, an actual open house. And you think about it, where do you keep your medications? Do you lock them up? They could be someplace just in your bathroom. If you have an open house, people are walking through your open house for real estate, and all of a sudden they take your drugs and they're gone. Do you know how many tablets are left in those products that you have in your house? When's the last time we counted them or checked? So if you, had, if you had 30 tablets of oxycodone in your house, when's the last time you actually counted them to see how many are there? Would you even know it if they were missing? How about grandparents? Do they have access that your, your children could access their medications? There's lots of different ways that people get a hold of them. And sometimes it's not your children that you worry about. Sometimes it's your children's friends that you have to worry about. They come over to the house. How easy is it for them to go into your medicine cabinet or your drawers and access those drugs? And would you know if they were even missing? And that's kind of what's scary. A lot of the kids are getting them from friends' houses. And you would never even know. So another thing that we think about with prescription drugs is why, why do kids start there? Well, obviously, it's a lot easier to pop a pill. It looks easy, it looks harmless. You've been doing that since you were young. You were told to take medication and it's safe. You never think that you're gonna end up there injecting. 
The other perception is that prescription drugs have positive benefits. We know that we're going to get prescriptions and we're probably going to get better. That's why we take them. So students very often are used to hearing about ADHD drugs, the stimulant drugs. They give you better performance in sports, better performance in school, and increase the ability to focus. That is what they're learning about ADHD drugs. So that's sometimes where they start. They start with a stimulant. And that's Ritalin, your Concerta, and these drugs that are there. And what's been being found is that this is sometimes where kids springboard off of. They start with taking a stimulant because they have access to them. There's a lot of kids with ADHD drugs that they have, uh, they have the ability to obtain. So sometimes you see kids in school with little trident gum wrappers passing things around, just passing out a piece of gum. But what's wrapped in there? Ritalin. That's how they pass things around. $20 here, I'll buy some Ritalin. Here's $20. The kids might not be taking it. They might just be handing it out and selling it. So mixing drugs. Um, we know that there are drug interactions when we mix drugs, but lots of times kids are taking drugs together on purpose because they want to compound the effects of it. So polydrug use is combining two or more drugs with the intention of achieving a particular effect. And we see that a lot with the opioids um, and then mixing them with amphetamines. So the amphetamines and the stimulants are your ADHD drugs. So very often what happens is kids start taking the, the stimulants because they do better at football and they can stay up and they can study. And they can focus more all of a sudden if they're taking these drugs. They might have been their friends. They don't see there's a problem with it. But then all of a sudden, they need a downer. They need to kind of come down. So then they kind of start possibly turning to an opioid, something like a sedative. And then they start taking those two together, one to bring them up and one to bring them down. Um, opioids are often mixed with other downers like alcohol or other uh, tranquilizers and sedatives like the anti-anxiety drugs and very often parents have those in their house too. The Xanax, the Clonopins, uh, Valiums, a lot of those are in your house too and those you have to watch out also. Um, there's something called the Trinity Cocktail, I think that's kind of old lingo now, but that's muscle relaxer, Xanax or Clonopin and one of your opioids, taking those together. And one of the, the scary things that I'm really hoping is not in this area at all. Is, is something where they call it farm parties or skittle parties or trail grazing. And this is kind of, this is just indicative of why you need to worry about what's in your house. Kids come to a party and they bring anything they can get their hands on, any prescription drug. It can be cough medicine, but most of the time for this, for these farm parties, it ends up being prescriptions. And scary enough, they take a bowl and to enter the party, they just have to pour the medicine that they bring into a bowl and anyone that comes in that contributes gets to take a handful of pills. Doesn't matter what it is, nobody even knows what it is. They take a handful of pills and you chase them with alcohol. And whatever effect you get from it, that's the fun in it. And those are called farm parties, skittle parties, there's a lot of different things. Um, and they chase them with alcohol. There's also parties that involve cough syrups. You know, you mix cough syrup with, um, you know, with alcohol. And there's even rap songs about it. I'm sure you guys have heard those, if not, we should, probably should have played it. Um, but it's very scary. Sometimes they just think, drugs are safe, I can mix these, and that's not the truth. So what can you do? These things are out there and they're happening. So the first thing we recommend is monitor. Be aware of the quantities of prescription medications that you have in your home. Now we talk about controlled substances, uh, controlled substances and opioids a lot, but there are other drugs that can um, that can increase the effect of these drugs. So even if, increase the effects of opioids and other things. So even if you don't think it's a controlled substance and you're not gonna be using it, please just try to get rid of that drug also. Um, keep track of your refills. We're supposed to ID people when they pick up a, a controlled prescription, but that often doesn't happen. Somebody can see that there's refills, call it in and go pick it up and get a whole entire refill of your prescription. Now, you might think my child would never do this, but if your teen is on medications, such as ADHD medications, stimulants, anti-anxiety medications, or painkillers, watch them take it. You don't want them to end up being that student that's handing out Trident gum wrappers, um, you know, that have drugs wrapped in them because they get $20 a pop for it. Or because, hey, you know what, my friend really didn't get a lot of sleep and he really needs to, you know, get a great grade on this test, or he really wanted to win this football game, so I'm gonna supply the football team with some Adderall. You know, don't let them do that. Just make sure they take the medication. Monitor. 
Even though you think they're old enough and they're responsible, you never know what peer pressure is going to do. Make sure your friends, relatives, and neighbors monitor their supply also. Um, you know, I'm watching my neighbor's cats right now. I can see right on the counter the, med the medications in their house. But what if I was not on the up and up? Would they know how many were missing? I have perfect access. So secure. What would you do with your, your valuables in your house? What would you do if you had bottles of liquor and you had teenagers in your house? Would you just leave those out? You don't want to do that with your prescription medications. Um, unlocked medicine cabinets are not the best place for them. I'm not even sure why we call them medicine cabinets. Um, just for humidity, they're not the best place to keep them in the first place. But keep them locked up and secure. They should not be someplace where anyone can just walk in the house and find them. Um, there are lots of tools out there for you. Um, you don't see them out front in pharmacies, unfortunately, but you will start to see these more and more. Um, there are locked cabinets that you can find. There's a whole bunch of them on Amazon, and, they're, and they range from like $30 to $80. You can even, you can even just use your, your regular safe, but it's kind of a pain to do the whole, um, you know, the whole combination. Lock them up if you can. Keep them safe. Keep them away from um, open view. There's a lot of other cool things, too, um, that you can find online or just even in pharmacies. I think over the next year or so, you're going to see a lot of pharmacies carrying some pretty cool stuff. This one's a timer cap, and I'm going to pass it around. You actually put the cap on your vial, and every time you open it, the timer resets. So if anybody was to get into your medication, you'd know that they had been in there before it was time to actually get in there. And it, this, this thing will go on for three years. It'll last for a long time. Eventually, you will have to change the top. But then every time you get a new prescription bottle, it's, as long as it's the same size, you can just put it right on top. There are also vials and caps that actually have um, like a little combination on top. You know, but remember, when it comes to these things, if somebody really wants to get a hold of it and steal it, they can just smash the bottle open. This is better for you know, what we call grazers, the people that just take one, take another, and think that you'll never notice. The best thing you can do is actually just totally dispose of your medication. So if you're not using anymore, for all of those of you who have your cough syrup that was 10 years ago, you just keep it because you don't know what to do with it, now is the right time. New York State is finally allowing people to return, not return, but to discard of um, controlled substances. We were able to, um, to kind of dispose of non-controlled substances, but now we can actually return them. And what I mean by return is you can bring them back to a pharmacy or another location and we can get them properly disposed of. Um, and there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, one of the things that I have here today is pretty helpful. This is what we call um, a takeaway bag or a mail-away bag. Um, and these are available at several pharmacies. Price Shopper Pharmacy does also have these. They're about $5 per bag. Tonight I have a whole bunch that I'm going to hand out to you guys free. Um, and that's compliments of Sharps who actually puts these out. Um, all you do is you take your control medications. And what I'd recommend is putting a little bit of cotton or tissue paper so that the tablets don't rattle. So it's not obvious because, believe it or not, UPS and FedEx and mail carriers do steal drugs too. Um, I hate to say that, but that happens. So put them in here. And it's already addressed and, and ready to go. Just put them in here, seal it and put it in the mailbox. And then they'll, they're sent directly to Sharps and they're immediately incinerated. So this is the best way to get rid of them. And you can do this with your, I have a couple for each person, so you, know, you can give them to your relatives, your friends, your, um, anyone that you think would, would um, benefit from this. The other thing is um, some police stations actually have drop boxes. I think the only one in this area is the Trooper Barracks in Loudonville. Um, so that's quite a drive, so this might actually be better, but that is a location that you can drop off. So within the next six months to a year, you're going to start to see a whole bunch of um, boxes like this at pharmacies, which are, um, some of them are going to be red, some are going to be green, they're not all red boxes, but they're going to be right outside the pharmacy. And you can just go in and you can drop your control prescriptions, regular prescriptions, anything that you have, you can just drop them in there. The pharmacist will, every, you know, when it gets full, scoops it up. It seals right away so nobody gets to take a look at it. And it's completely confidential. No one ever looks at what, who put what in there, and it gets incinerated. So that's the best. Disposal is the best thing to do. Now, if you don't want to use any of these options, 
You can throw them away. Do not put them in the trash. Do not flush them down the toilet. Um, that's a whole another hour conversation about our water and, you know, as you know, there's a lot of that going on already. But um, we don't need any more drugs in our water. So if you're gonna, if you have to dispose of them at home, take coffee grounds or kitty litter or something and mix them in there with that and then it'll help um, break it apart so that it won't, um, it won't have any efficacy and it can't be stolen. So do not flush. So be aware and be prepared. So sometimes in, in pharmacies, people come in and say, you know, hey, I have a question. I think my kid might be on drugs. And there's, there's certain things that you can look for. Um, and I'm not going to get into that because there's other people that are a little bit uh, more versed in that here than I am. But learn the slang. There's a lot of great websites that can help you learn the slang that your teens are using, what they're texting. Um, that's pretty neat because we have, um, I've actually been shown a, a phone that a mom took from, um, from her son and there was a bunch of different terms on there and we were able to look them up and decide that yes, those were drug terms. So just kind of, you know, get to learn the, um, the slang a little bit and I'm not sure if in this area, you know, there's, there's different slang in every area, um, but maybe some, there's some resources here that could help, help you with that. Um, and then know your resources. Um, there's lots of great resources out there. Um, Arrowhead, I'm just, is not really necessarily a resource for you, but this is a very interesting site um, I actually go on air with a lot because it helps, it helps inform me as to what people are abusing. This is an actual site of people that, um, that do abuse drugs and like psychotropic effects and they actually publish it. Um, some for good reasons, some for bad reasons, but this is a site where you can kind of gauge what's going on and you can also learn what people are starting to mix, mix together. Um, so it's very interesting to kind of, you know, um, keep up with the the future of drug abuse. So when I say be prepared, um, not everyone needs to be fully prepared, but if I had a teenager in my house um, and I had friends coming in and out, I would want to be prepared, even though I might have faith in them that they weren't going to be doing anything wrong. Um, there is something that you can do now if you feel like anyone else is at risk for a, an opioid drug over overdose. And um, Dr. Daly did talk about naloxone this only will use for, uh, can work for opioid overdoses, so we're talking about the hydrocodone, um, the oxycodone, the fentanyl, the morphine. Um, this is something you can keep. So what naloxone is, it's, um, it's actually an op opioid antagonist. So it can counter the effects of an overdose, um, and it's non-scheduled. It's a, it is a prescription medication. This is over-the-counter and in Europe, so you can actually walk in and get it in most countries. Um, so what you would use this for is if you thought somebody was having an overdose, there's many different formulations, but you can actually administer this. You get a little bit of training, and then you just administer it, and there's no harmful effects, if, even if the person's not having an overdose. So right now, um, you can go into your local pharmacies, and you can ask for naloxone. Now, a lot of people would be a little nervous about that, saying, I don't want people thinking that I have an issue, but that's not the case. We're trying to push people getting naloxone who think that they might have somebody around them that could possibly overdose. The pharmacist will train you and will fill a prescription for you, and there's two different formulations that most uh, pharmacists will fill for. One is a nasal spray, and I'm going to pass this around too so everyone can kind of take a look at it, and the other is an auto-injector called FZO. And this is kind of like EpiPens, if anyone's familiar with that. It actually will talk. If you, you know, it's a, this one's a trainer, so there's actually no drug in it. Um, it will talk and let you know what to do. So if someone's having an overdose. This trainer contains no needle yep. or drug. But it'll walk you through exactly what to do. So um, although this is traditionally administered by um, emergency response personnel in hospitals, now if you feel like there's someone around you that might be at risk, you can keep this in your house. The pharmacy will train you on it so you know how to use it. Um, and then you can just be better prepared. So this is just a slide on how naloxone works. Um, you know, just kind of replacing the um, opioid from the receptors. So 
Um, if you are interested, there's several different ways you can get, get naloxone. You can just walk into your pharmacy. You can have your doctor write a prescription for it, even though that's not, ne that's not really necessary. And you can also get it free through a lot of different sources like Catholic Charities. Um, when you get the prescription, it actually comes with three refills on it. So if you needed to refill, you could. Um, they also want you to report just because they want to see how many people are actually getting to use naloxone and how many lives it's saving. So once again, naloxone, and I'll pass this around, can be used and can be given to anyone, but we do recommend it if there's someone in your life who you think might have a problem with opioids or heroin, which is an opioid. Um, this won't work with anything like the stimulants, ADHD drugs, or anything like that, but um, it's definitely good to have. Okay, that's it for me. I'm going to pass these around. And at the end, um, anybody who would like one of the take-back bags or a couple, just come see me. I'll be over there with the take-back bags and hand them out, okay? I guess we're not nice to each other. Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Good? I feel like I'm back talking to the kids and always talking back. Um, I'm Mike Whiteley. I'm a detective with the Bethlehem Police Department. And when I can find my presentation. Um, so I wanted to, I, I don't want to take a lot of time because um, I know there's two kids up here that have great experiences at um, they want to share with you that's going to have a huge impact. So, um, but I wanted to kind of share with you guys what I told the kids today so that you can go home so you know what they got um, and you kind of help understand where they're coming from as well. My perspective on this is a little bit of, you know, what's going on in our own backyard. The first thing to understand is that what is our population? So within the town of Bethlehem, from 10 years and 19 year olds, we're talking about 5,000 people. Okay, um, so to, to break that down into law enforcement involvement, we actually kind of break it down a little bit more again into juveniles and adults. All right, juveniles in New York State is um, between the ages of seven and 15. So the people, the age range that we see routinely is between 13 and 15 year olds. So from January 2015 until right now, that's not January 16th, I probably should have changed that. So for a year, almost a year and a couple months, um, we've had 17 juvenile arrests. Unfortunately, one of those was regarding controlled substance possession, and eight of them were regarding criminal mischief or damage to property. Compared to 2014, when we looked at a total of 21 arrests with no um, controlled substance arrests, but a possession of marijuana and a property crime. The reason why I added those criminal mischiefs and the, the non substance is that when we look at these, a lot of times the common denominator could be a substance. It's either underage drinking parties, um, coming to and from the underage drinking parties, peer pressure, bad decision making, um, marijuana use when they're out and about, and a lot of times that while they're under the influence, they're having that bad decision making and then they're damaging people's property. When we jump up to the older kids, 16 to 19, we're looking at about 45 arrests. And those are just for substances. 28 of them for possession of marijuana and then 11 of them for controlled substances. And I broke that down a little bit more because I think it's important to look at the fact of our 18 year olds in the town of Bethlehem seem to be having a little bit of trouble. They're causing, they're, they're having the most marijuana arrests. And as we look at this chart on your left, the marijuana possession, that's a violation, all right? So it's kind of like a traffic ticket. That's the lowest offense that they could have. The second chart, or second column there is the criminal possession controlled substance seventh. So that's a, that's a misdemeanor possession. That would be for small amounts of, um, small amounts of narcotic drugs, um, anything really other than um, marijuana, mar uh, prescription drugs and things like that. Controlled, controlled substance, fifth, third, and second, those are our felonies. Those are the serious ones. Those are ones that would be immediate arraignment. Those are the ones that would be resulting in most likely bail um, because of risk of, of uh, flight. Um, and those would be the ones that sometimes end up in Albany County Jail pending um, further 
processing. So our 18-year-olds have a, a pretty large population that we deal with. So what are the consequences? Obviously, if you're caught in possession of an illegal substance, if you're breaking the law, you're going to be arrested. All right? So that's the first thing that happens. And after an arrest, there's going to be an arraignment. And with violations and misdemeanors, the arraignment usually takes a, a week or two. Um, they're given an appearance ticket. They're sent on their way as long as they're supervised. And, um, and they have to come back. For felonies, because of the risk level, they are most likely arraigned right then and there and brought before the judge. And then they're looking at a disposition. For our minor offenses in the town of Bethlehem, we have a great program called Bethlehem Youth Court. It's actually a peer court. It's something where there's no guilt or innocence decided. It's a uh, community service hours is decided. And it's decided not by adults who, stand, who tell the kid this was wrong, but it's a, decided by a jury of their peers, other kids, that will tell them you need 30 hours, 40 hours, 50 hours of community service because of what, what happened. And that's not just for substance, but that's for any, any crimes that occur. A lot of these, um, if it doesn't go through youth court, we're looking at fines. Um, community service that can be sentenced through the courts as well. The impact, obviously the worst impact is a confinement. All right? Albany County Jail sentencing um, during the time of uh, arraignment to disposition um, and then it could be as part of the sentence as well. Any conviction that a child has, any conviction that from the 16 to 19 range, um, it could become part of their permanent record, which again, the loss of scholarship needs to be considered. Um, the employment impacts and future is also considered as well. And if they're lucky enough to be um, dispositioned without a confinement, they're going to be placed in a community supervision, something like probation. So not only would they, if they're school age, they have to deal with the, or the rules and code of conduct at school, and they have to deal with their uh, rules uh, in the house, but now they also have to follow the rules, orders, and conditions of the court that's supervised by probation. So, if somebody breaks their curfew, if your child, son or daughter breaks their curfew tonight, you give them a timeout in their bedroom. If they're on probation and they break your curfew, they get a timeout in Albany County Jail. So there's a lot more consequences regarding their, their actions. Four to five heroin, excuse me, four to five new heroin users starts with prescription drug first. And we also see that the younger that we see experimentation in, with drug use, the greater the chance they are of having an addiction problem later in life. So this is why within the Bethlehem Police Department and the Bethlehem School District, we have D.A.R.E. program, 20 years and running, longest in New York State. We're teaching D.A.R.E. to our fifth graders. All right? And that program has changed over the years. And there was also, you know, we can go back to the 90s when it started, and um, the curriculum has changed so much, and, and now it's becoming a little bit more evidence-based. And it's not so much about saying no to drugs. It's about making good choices. And then um, in the middle school, eighth grade, they have health classes. And I'm in the, uh, I go to the health classes as well, and we do a presentation like a post air. And then they come up to high school, and um, we have a Detective Rice at the high school that does work with the kids as well. So we're, with the police department, we're here to, to support them and to educate them, just like we're, we're here for tonight. And then that final thing that I, I, I want the kids to know is that there is protection for them in case they get into trouble. And if you remember um, prom nights or signing contracts where the kids will call you if they need a ride home. And this is something that this will also help because calling you is great, but if it, they say that they're in trouble, they got somebody in trouble, then you have to call 911 and everything else puts a little extra delay in there. Nine, 2011, they signed this Good Samaritan, 911 Good Samaritan Law. So basically this says that if someone were to call 911 for a medical emergency that's associated with substance abuse, they are protected from criminal arrest and prosecution. And this relates to not only opioids, narcotics, this relates to underage drinking and marijuana use as well. All right? Because what we were seeing is that before they would call 911, before they would call EMS, they would spend time and clean up the needles, get rid of the drugs, and, and, and clean up the, the scene where this person was dying. And like Dr. Daly said, the time from stop breathing to stop beating is minutes. And it takes time to clean things up. So by the time law enforcement gets there first and EMS second, that person has already been to a point that we can't reverse them. Um, the Narcan system that was talked about here, Bethlehem has that program. We work with Albany Medical Center. Um, 
I'm actually the coordinator for the, the Narcan program within the department. All cars, patrol cars that patrol at night, day, night, have a Narcan kit in their AED kit. Um, middle school, high school SROs have Narcan kits with us as well within the schools. So we have that ability to respond there quickly to make these reversals that we can do. Um, one other thing, and I always forget to put the slide in, is that here in the town of Bethlehem, the stats that I show for the kids, you know, we don't see a lot of possession arrests. If we were to look at adults, if we look at all possession arrests, we don't really have a lot. But what we do have a lot of are, are regular arrests. We have our petty larcenies. We have our domestic violence. We have, um, cr um, identity theft, burglary, robbery, car larcenies. And when we make those arrests and we have those people back in the holding cell, you know, they, we talk to them. And sometimes they may look like, you know, they're having a tough time. So we talk. And a lot of times what the common denominator with a lot of these crimes for the people that we're arresting is a substance abuse addiction. So, yes, we don't have a lot of possession arrests because I could be carrying 10 decks of heroin in my pocket and you'd never know it. I could be walking right past somebody. I can't, as a law enforcement, I just can't stop and search people. All right? Um, they're not going to have the odor like marijuana would. They're not going to have the odor like alcohol would. Um, so we're seeing not so much that possession as we're seeing the crimes that are associated with it. You know? So with just today, a larceny at a local supermarket, which resulted in an arrest with someone who was actually in possession of, of heroin. So every day, we're having some sort of reaction with it. So, um, that's just something to remind us so when we see those crimes, there's a reason for it. So uh, in closure, I just want to thank you guys very much for coming in and listening. Um, I, I want to thank the school district for doing these type of programs. I think it's great. We in Bethlehem Police Department, especially the Family Services Unit, making up myself, Detective Beck, who teaches there, and then Detective Rice, who's here at the high school, um, wouldn't be here without the support of, you know, Chief Corsi and Deputy Chief Heffernan as well. So thank you very much for coming today, and I'll be around later for any questions. All right. My name is Jack Daly. I'm the admissions coordinator for Hope House Adolescent Unit, and I have a master's in business administration, and I'm a credentialed alcohol and substance abuse counselor. I've been um, at the adolescent unit with Hope House for four years and have seen it grown from 20 beds to 40 beds, which is telling in a four-year period. Over that time frame, I've seen the opioid and other drug use escalate from about 30% of our population, climbing more towards 60%. And in the girls' house, I find it even a little bit higher. And the way I get the kids is a multitude of things. As the officers and some of the other panel have pointed out, a lot of our kids have interaction with the criminal justice system. I go to the jails, I get calls from the jails, drug courts, treatment courts, as well as emergency rooms schools, school counselors. It's coming from all over. It doesn't seem to have any boundaries or borders at all anymore. And it's getting kind of scarier. And I have an assistant now who has to help with the influx of calls we're getting. Our program is about a six month average length of stay. And the kids come in and they work on their school, their substance abuse, and they have to work on making a change as well as staying in compliance with a lot of their um, legal mandates, I'm going to call it because some of our kids, and I call them kids, because they're 14 to 20 years old, face some severe prison time in some cases. And it's just because they've made some bad decisions, and a lot of them started, as the pharmacist and the doctor said, starting in their parents' medicine cabinet, and it's escalated to some of it full-blown heroin use, dealing, and the crimes kind of just keep escalating till the kids kind of keep digging themselves deeper. Our goal is to help them make a change, transition back to a safe environment, and kind of move forward in their lives and get a second start. And that's what the, the rule and the um, mission of Hope House is. So I'm going to let you talk to these two young gentlemen who are really doing well in the program, and they have a message that they need to get out. Thank you. OK. Um, my name is Austin. I'm 17 years old. I grew up right in a small, t in a small town, Ravina, 
you know. Um, it's very small. Everybody knows each other. Um, can't really, you don't really miss much. It's a boring town, nothing really to do. Everybody does the same thing. You know, we have an okay sports programs. Um, we have a lot of good students, but it's, you know, it's up and down depending on what it is. But um, tonight I'm gonna share a little bit of my experience, strength, and hope, and uh, kind of just where I started off to where I am now. And it all started in um, seventh grade, about 11 or 12 years old, started smoking weed. And um, it, it wasn't anything I did on a daily basis, but it was something I liked. And um, my older brother did it, and uh, it's something I kind of like looked up to. And he's someone I looked up to, and I you know, thought that if he was doing it, I could do it. And it started progressing over the year. Um, started getting into trouble in school and stuff. But I was still doing what I had to do, and it really didn't like have a control of me yet. And by ninth grade, um, I was doing it every day. Um, started failing school. About half halfway through my freshman year, I um, got expelled. I ended up catching a possession charge in school of marijuana, and got put on probation. Um, I did like a, about six months on probation, but since I was only 14, um, they couldn't really do much. They didn't really have much power over me at all. I was still smoking, still doing what I was doing. Didn't really listen. Um, you know, I st stopped listening to my mom. Never really had my dad in my life much. He has always been, he's in the, he was in the military, so he was always all over the country, so. It was just me, my mom, and my little brother, and uh, I didn't really listen to my mom at all once I was really, you know, once really weed got a hold of me. And, um, you know, a lot of people say it's not a gateway drug, but, you know, it is what you make it. And it sure was for me because I don't think if I ever got that first high, I would have went any farther. And about 10th grade, I, um, I failed ninth grade twice, finally made it to 10th. And by 10th grade, I just could care less what I was doing, who I was hanging out with. You know, I stopped, I started pushing away from a lot of the good friends I had and doing stuff that I shouldn't have been doing at a young age. And um, I had dropped out of school when I turned 16. Well, a little before that, I actually was hanging out with like a lot of um, older kids, right from the right from the area, and I was drinking every night, um, you know, driving around, you know, people were driving drunk. I was going to parties, you know, lying to people saying I was 18 and just doing what I thought was the cool thing, I guess, and. Um, about 16, I, uh, I started doing Molly and do, going to a lot of parties and uh, going to a lot of UAlbany parties and, you know, the college campus and everything like that. And I thought I was living a good life. I was, you know, I was, I was happy at the time, you know. I, you know, I wasn't going to school. I was also selling weed to, you know, get by and definitely pay for my use and um I you know I was young so I thought you know with me selling weed like I didn't have to go to school you know I was making more money than like some people's parents you could say so like I thought you know I was you know something you uh, know it all just started going downhill I uh ended up getting introduced to Xanax um the first time I did it, I, you know, I don't even remember the night, and I have m many of those nights. Um, I woke up the next morning, and I thought it was, like, so cool that I, like, 
didn't remember what happened. And then I wanted to like do it again. Like I thought that was just like a good feeling. Like I had no idea what happened. People were telling me like, yo, you were messed up last night. You're doing this or that. And I was like, really? Like, you know, I thought I got, I got kind of a kick out of it. And I started doing it like kind of like on the daily, like twice or two or three times a week, depending on the night or what I was doing. And um, it slowly but surely became an everyday thing. And I was getting to the point to where I wasn't remembering like days upon it, like days and days and days and sometimes weeks. There was a time where I remember like I was forgetting everybody's name. Like, I mean, it was, it was, it was disgusting. Like, I mean, didn't remember what I just did 10 minutes ago. And, you know, I didn't think I, I didn't think I had a problem. You know, I didn't see it at all. And um, I ended up moving with my dad to Georgia when I was 16 and um, cause I had to get away because I was just so messed up and you know, going down the wrong path. My mom was really scared and she just, she didn't know what to do with me. She didn't want to, she didn't want me to, you know, get in trouble or end up, ending up in a rehab. You know, she just was trying to, she didn't know what to do. So she sent me with my dad and um, came back about like 10 days later. You know, I thought I had it all figured out. Like, I thought I was good. I thought everything was going to be fine. You know, I, you know, played innocent. Like, you know, it was just, I wasn't addicted. It was just something I was doing, and I thought I was going to be fine. Um, so I came back, and within a couple weeks, I was back at it again, doing the same thing, but even worse. And it just picked up more and more than it ever has. And I, within three months, I got arrested three times, starting um, of August of last year. I caught a petty larceny charge. Um, I went to jail for a night. No, I got, a, I, got a, I got away with that one. I got put on probation, a year of probation. I um no actually I actually wasn't even hadn't even gone to court yet by the time I called my second charge I called another petty larceny for the same thing, they sent me to jail. Um, I was looking at a six five split where you do six months in the county jail and five years probation, and um, you know I, I was just a wreck in there. I wasn't even there 24 hours and uh, my mom had bailed me out. Um. Went home, you know, I, I, thought I thought I was really done. I thought that was enough, and it wasn't. I was like 28 days sober and clean and um, got right back into it. I um, started hanging out with an old friend that I haven't, hadn't hung out with in a long time, and I thought I could, I seen how he was doing it, and he was, you know, you could say a functioning addict. He was going to work, going to school, while taking Xanax, you know, like a few at a time, one, like one or two a day, and he was fine. I you know, like, I mean, I thought he was fine. He could do everything and be high at the same time. So I thought I could be like that. So I started, before I knew it, I was, started taking it again. And it didn't, it wasn't really that bad, but within like a month, it was a mess again. And, uh, I was working a full-time job um, up in Latham. I thought I was doing really good. Well, I had been doing really good until I started using again, and uh, it got the best of me. I um, made this decision one night to um, go rob my store, and uh, I was working at a pet salon. And um, it was actually my, it's my mom's best friend's shop worst of all, and uh, I ended up going, I robbed it with my cousin. I broke in, stole about like $800 and uh, like 15 checks. And um, I was so messed up. I mean, I barely even remember the night. 
Next morning, detectives came knocking on my door, and um, I had cuts all over my hand. I um, must have cut myself on the glass on my way in, and um, they, you know, they were pressing me real hard, and I ended up pretty much just telling on myself. I mean, I, you know, they say, you know, if you don't want to say anything, you know, say you want your lawyer present, that kind of thing, or whatever. But I didn't, I, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I ended up bleeding all over the shop. And um, either way, if I didn't get caught at that moment, I would have ended up getting caught in the long run because they would have gotten my DNA. And um, I'm happy that it did happen the way it happened because I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, I'm looking at a two and a three to seven years in prison if I don't complete this program, well actually complete drug court, which is like a higher probation, you know, it's um you gotta do you gotta do a lot in it and um it's seventeen to twenty five months. So it's gonna be a long road but um I've been sober for five months and four days, hundred and fifty four days. So it's the longest I've been sober in a long time and it feels great. And within the past two and a half months that I've been in Hope House and the three months that I spent in jail, I've learned a lot. Um, I don't ever want to go back out and do what I was doing. I feel great. I'm healthy. I got a really good relationship with my family. Um, I'm getting a lot of trust back. And I'm just, uh, and overall, I'm just learning like who I am without having to use and be who I was because it's been a long time since I've been sober in the past three, four years. So with that, I just want to thank you guys. And um, that's it. You can learn a lot from these facts, the presentations, the statistics being shown by the officials, um, especially about how widespread, serious, and dangerous this substance abuse is. But unless you've had a first or second hand experience with it, you'd never really get to witness how destructive it can be. And I guess that's part of the reason why I'm here today. Um, I'm here to say that it can happen to anyone, anywhere, at any time. I've met so many people from so many different rehabs. This is by far not my first facility who are all drug addicts but come from so many different backgrounds. Some from suburbs, some from urban areas, some from straight up middle of nowhere. And they're all addicts. Um, I never really had many experiences with opioid use, but my mother and father did. My father is currently getting out of his first long-term prison incarceration, not his first incarceration though, for making methamphetamines and doing heroin to wind down from the methamphetamines he was also doing while selling them. My mother has been in and out of prison. I believe this upcoming one would be her fifth time since I was four years old, um, all from heroin addiction. Um, she's on her way back now, which is it's very disappointing, painful. But I feel as though Somehow, some way, though I can't change that, I can keep it from happening to other people by coming to places like this and doing things like this. Um, I started using at a, my father was the first person that used with me, which is another point I'd like to make. P kids can start using in the most unexpected of ways. My father was the pers first person that used with me. Um, he was also the first person that ever gave me an opioid. I was definitely addicted 
immediately, but I never had enough access to them to get too far into it. Thank God, because with the way I was using it, I'd probably be dead. I was what was known as a garbage head, which is um, I'd do just about any drug in any quantity to get as high as I possibly could at any time. Um, oftentimes you'll hear about duster aerosols, how just one hit can kill you. I went through an entire week-long period knowing that one hit could kill me, cause brain cancer, put black spots on my brain or even holes in my brain, still using duster the entire week just to get high. Um, I believe that week too I abused a lot of prescription medication. I'm talking, my friend handed me three Klodipin, five minutes later, I bet you can't take four more, took them. An hour later, I bet you can't take seven more, took them. I should have been dead so many occasions in my life, but somehow for the reason that I think, well, the reason that I think it's the reason that I might be able to change just a small factor in somebody's life that could save their lives, I'm still here today. Um, I've nearly overdosed on alcohol twice. Both times I ended up getting arrested. Going, um, First time, got arrested, didn't really, I took it as a joke, took probation as a joke, went to jail, got out four months afterwards, three months after my 17th, three days after my 17th birthday, spent my 17th birthday in jail, and within 10 days of getting out, I caught another charge, substance abuse. Decided I wanted to steal alcohol from the job I was working at and get as drunk as I possibly could. Now, I'm on mood stabilizers, which is, um, they're more commonly known as antipsychotics. When reacting with alcohol, they cause you to hallucinate. I ended up walking into some random chick's house at six o'clock in the morning, sitting on her couch and very pleasantly telling her I owned her house. She could not kick me out. Um, I, was, I was going somewhere with that. Um, oh yeah, and throughout that night, I had a total of four to five hours unaccounted for, for what I did, what I was doing during that time period. My assumption is I was just walking around, but I remember slightly, at a small amount, leaving my friend's house, starting to walk home, and from there it just disappeared. Woke up in the morning in the hospital being told that I'd nearly died, and the moment that all of it was flushed out of my system, I was going to need to go to the jail to get booked. Um, that came a remote, then came a remote turning point in my life. I mean, for about four months after that, I used just as I normally would, probation. Uh, still on probation and um, just not caring, but there's, I can, I can say there's always been a part of me and it's grown bigger over the years through more pain and self-disappointment that has wanted to quit but just didn't know how. Um, turns out there's a lot of resources, and I'm glad to be one, one person that could just change a small part of somebody's life, and with that I'm pretty much about to close, um, but, oh yes, that's what I was looking for. I've been to a lot of these speaking engagements, and one thing I've tended, tended to hear, and I know a lot of you are parents, um, is that parents tend to have this thought of, not me, couldn't happen to my kid. It, it can, and if the community, every community as a whole doesn't do something to stop it, it will eventually end up happening to a lot more people. I'm glad that People have been that people have come together to stop it, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Thank you guys for attending this. It means a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your stories.